then 10 days, 20 days, 40 days, 80 days, 160 days, and 320 days, and there's another line there that you can barely see, 640 days. And you can see it basically stopped warming at that point, so it came to what's called steady state conditions. But you'll notice the problem with, and this is with a relatively minor canopy. This is one with um, 10 millibars of water vapor in it, which is about uh, a foot of water, a foot of liquid water in vapor form on top of today's atmosphere. And the temperature at the surface of the Earth comes out at 400 degrees Kelvin, which is almost 100 degrees centigrade above the boiling point of water. In other words, it's extremely hot on the surface of the Earth with this relatively minor canopy. So water vapor is a really good greenhouse gas. Well, that's where uh, my student, Dave, left his, his model, and he had some suggestions or recommendations about what we might do, but it was a little discouraging. He tried this at a number of different canopy depths, and he had a final surface temperature of around 300 and some degrees um, Kelvin. If you put more in it, it got hotter and hotter until you got up to as high as 500 degrees Kelvin, extremely hot and probably would increase slightly more than that, but with a mass of a canopy equal to what Dr. Dillow had suggested of 100 millibars or about, let's see, is that 100? No, that's 1,000 millibars, which is about the equivalent to the mass of our atmosphere today. So it's extremely hot, and that was the basic problem. Well, I've done a number of other models. I've been able to fix it a little bit. I've, got, I've convinced up to as much as three feet of liquid water with some really strong adjustments so that the temperature wasn't so cold, or it wasn't so hot. But until this last year, I didn't have any way of really getting that temperature down at all. And what I'm suggesting at this time is possibly if for some reason the radiation coming from the sun is not as great as we know it today, by the way, this is a perfect example of uniformitarianism, we've been assuming that the uh, solar radiation in the past has been the same as it is today. That's uniformity, right? So it occurred to me, why don't I make some adjustments there? I don't know why it would change, but let's just assume it did. And so I've, I'm now looking at variation all the way from 1% up to 100% of today's radiation. Now, whether that radiation would be reduced because the sun is not putting out as much, or because the Earth's atmosphere is reflecting more from the top of it so it doesn't get down into the atmosphere because once it gets in then it gets trapped and there's all kinds of radiation problems or maybe there was dust between the sun and the earth and for some reason and it couldn't get to the earth or let's see what was the last oh this is a really heretical idea maybe the radius between the earth's the sun's orbit or the earth's orbit around the sun was greater than it was or is today. That means it's further away. For every time you double the distance, you get one-fourth as much radiation per unit area on the, on the Earth. So I've explored that possibility. Now, that throws all kinds of kinks and other issues, but, you know, that's what a theoretician does. So I've, I've, I've not really addressed why the radiation might be, but I've explored what it would be if it was between 100% of, like today, all the way down to 1%. Here's an example of that same type of calculation I showed before with a temperature here in degrees Kelvin, height in the atmosphere, starting with a temperature of 170 degrees, uh, completely uniform. And the reason we start with that, by the way, that's, that's the way it has been done in the literature, in the conventional literature, so we got some comparative ways of looking at it. And it also doesn't put any bias in there. If you started with some temperature that was close to one of these, uh, someone could accuse you of... Uh, uh, biasing the calculation. If you start with a uniform distribution, very cold, and let it warm up, or in this case, cool off, then whatever it comes to equilibrium at is what you're going to find. So here's one in which we have 1% of the solar constant, that's the radiation coming from the sun today, and it cooled off with time, and this is at the poles, by the way. You've got to worry about latitude, look at the poles and the equator, and you find after 1,280 days, it comes to equilibrium here, but the temperature at the surface of the Earth is like 140 degrees Kelvin. Extremely cold. I mean, that's colder than anything we have on the Earth today. And it turns out that if you do have that, you are going to be worrying in the upper part, the upper part of the atmosphere where it's even colder, way down here close to 70 degrees Kelvin, that you're going to start condensing out the oxygen and the nitrogen, not just water vapor. So you have to worry about the whole atmosphere collapsing. 
This began to remind me of a science fiction story I read when I was in high school. I, I became a scientist because I let, read science fiction. Um, they weren't quite as ev uh, evolutionary in those days. It was more, well, they were space aliens and things like that, I guess. But uh, th there was a story, I don't even remember the name of the story now, but I remember this guy was on a planet and it got so cold that the whole atmosphere fell out and it was about this thick and it was in solid form. And he, had to, he was breathing in a cave to try to survive until a spaceship came to rescue him. Well, that's what this reminds me of. We've got an extremely cold environment where the whole atmosphere collapses. Well, you can look at the other situation at the equator where it's gonna be warmer. And in fact, here's what it looks like with 100% of today's solar constant at the equator, starting with the same 170 degrees Kelvin, and it warms. And again, we get back to what we found before, approaching 400 degrees Kelvin at the surface of the Earth. These are times from zero to 1280 days. And you see it comes to equilibrium. Okay, well, let's, let's look at... Uh, Let's look at it as a function of solar constant. Assuming you start with one, if you, these are equilibrium values now for 1% of the solar radiation at the poles, and it has a surface temperature like 140 degrees. At 100%, it's up around 240 degrees Kelvin, which is still about minus 30 degrees centigrade. That's quite cold at the poles, but you've got quite a range there you could play with. At the equator, uh, this is 1% uh, up through 100%, and you notice at the equator, at 100%, again, you've got those high temperatures, but you also got colder temperatures even at the equator. So now what I'm finding is we have the range to play with, both at the poles and at the equator, and now I could potentially increase the amount of mass in the vapor canopy and still retain temperatures that might be livable. So that's where I'm at in that research, and I wanted to report that to you. Here are the conclusions from that. The solar radiation may have been less in the past. It may have been as much as 25% or less, if some of these models are valid. A vapor canopy may have actually been needed in order to keep the atmosphere from getting too cold. And healthier conditions may have existed if we had enough of a mass in the canopy to increase the pressure at the surface. So basically what I'm saying is the vapor canopy theory is still alive. It's not exactly well, but at least it's alive. So I'll keep reporting as we continue to do research on this. I, I realize that I may be dangling you out for a few years because, you know, some of you said, ah, I'm going to give up on that. A lot of people said that's not legitimate theory. It's not working, so we'll give it up. Yeah, I, I wanted to keep working on it. I was about to give it up, but I'm going to keep going a little bit.